Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our another Secret Sunday session. And for this little edition, um, come around Christmas time, I thought I'd provide my resources and who I've used during my recovery to um, share with you guys what I've learned from amazing people. And today, I am here with my amazing psychiatrist, Dr. Glenn Craig. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about meditation and also the teenage brain. So I want to start by asking Dr. Craig, obviously I am on medication called Zoloft. Um, how do you know which person is suited for a certain medication? Because there's so many medications out there, but how do you know which one will work for particular people? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the nice intro, by the way. Oh, cool. a bit of a role reversal today, yeah? Yes, <laughs> very much so. Um, Look, medications are, it's a touchy subject, isn't it? Because I don't think anyone wants to be on medication. And sometimes even the idea of being on medication means there's something wrong with you, which a lot of people find hard. Um, but it does sometimes have a role. So certainly not for everyone. I guess no matter what you do with medication, obviously all your other interventions are important and more important, aren't they? your therapies, your medical care, family support, all of that. So where medication comes in is we want that to augment those other therapies. Okay. So where the evidence says it might be helpful is for those who are suffering from anxiety or depression prior to the onset of their eating disorder. So they're the group who are going to do best. Yeah. So if there were hints of anxiety first before the eating disorder turned up, that's where people seem to do quite well. And they're the ones where, you know, you might suggest that a little bit earlier in the piece. Um, I guess the other role for medication is for acute relief. So sometimes, you know, as you know, maybe people don't appreciate how hard it is to sometimes eat that meal and to eat that food. And there's a lot of anticipation anxiety in the lead up. It's stressful during it, it's stressful afterwards. Um, so medications can sometimes help just pull down that distress, make it easier to get through that. Yep. So it's there to complement things. Yeah. And there is, there's a lot of different medications out there. How did you know, if we use myself as an example, how did you know that Zoloft was best suited for me? Yeah, so, so Zoloft, I guess, for those who don't know, is an antidepressant. So... Antidepressants are used for anxiety, for OCD, for trauma, for lots of things, but that's just what they're called because that's what they were used for first. Um, the risk with antidepressants in everyone is that they can do the opposite. So they can make some people more agitated, more anxious, more depressed, um, and that group is more vulnerable if you're under 18. Yeah. So there are ones we pick that are, le I guess, less likely to do that that are usually better tolerated, they've been around a long time. So your Zoloft, your sertraline's in that group. Um, so they're, just, they're called the SSRIs. They're the serotonin-based antidepressants. Um, so we try and pick the ones that are going to be the best tolerated, that have the most evidence. Yeah. Okay. So yourself, I'd have to go back and check this about me. But I reckon it should have been started with Oxetine first. Is that right? Yeah, in hospital I did start with that one. Yeah, so that's the usual one we start with in the under 18s, um, just because of that tolerability. Yeah. If that doesn't work, then often we pick another one from that group. So for you, that was Zoloft. Um, and fortunately, you did get a response from that. Yeah. Sometimes some people aren't so lucky, you have to try a few to try and get there. Yeah. Um, so really, it was about risk minimization, picking what's got the most evidence, what's going to be the best tolerated, because if it causes side effects, you're not going to take it. I know that. Um, and yeah, just trying to find the right one for that individual. Yeah. There is normally a lot of side effects that are listed. Um, should people be concerned of the side effects? Yeah, you, you should be mindful of the potential for side effects. Um, the problem is if you get that little leaflet out that's in your medication, you probably wouldn't take anything because there'll be a thousand things on there. Uh, the, the big ones with antidepressants is stomach upset. So almost the same symptoms that anxiety can cause. Feeling sick in your knee, feeling headachey, feeling a bit tired. Um, for those where it might be relevant, it can cause some sexual dysfunction. So 
a lot of older adolescents or adults, sometimes that's a barrier if it can cause any problems in that important area. Um, the biggest risk is it doing the opposite, as I said, making you more anxious, more agitated. Yeah. Um, but certainly if you're going to go on medication, you'd hope that your doctors have spoken to you about the common side effects. Um, generally, if you start with low doses and slowly build them, if you have them with food, which sometimes is a challenge, but to have something in your stomach, that's less likely to be a problem. And I guess you'd hope that whoever starts it organises to review you so that you can talk about any of those problems. Um, and if, I guess if you're an adolescent and the, the sexual side effects are there, hopefully they talk to you on your own. So you've got an opportunity to, to volunteer that one without mum or dad in the room. <laughs> yes. Um, and I guess there is the other argument that people are definitely very much in the 21st century about natural ways of healing your yep. body. What's your argument? Because I think the other side is very much, you know, just waiting for your body to heal itself and not taking a tablet that could disrupt the chemicals that are already naturally supposed to be helping yourself. So what's your argument in terms of medication and its role in helping people rather than just letting the body do its natural process? Yeah, so I think it's about the individual. So I'm sure that there are going to be cases where you let the body do its thing and you'll be okay. But for a lot of people, that's not the case. Um, so I think it's important to know that the medications are antidepressants. They're not changing your body. They're not changing your brain. They're not causing any long-term side effects. All they're doing is making the chemicals that we should already be making, just making them more available to create that stability. So I think for a lot of people, there is a risk that if they if they just wait and let your body run its natural course, that illness is going to be, become more severe, that they're going to deteriorate further yeah. than they might require other intervention. Um, but as I said, that should be part of complementing your, your other treatments. You know, these things should all be working together. Yeah. You know, their own. Um, so and, why, know, oh, sorry, you go, you continue. You're right, you're right. There you go, you go. No, I was going to say, so why would someone's chemicals, I guess, become imbalanced and they have to take a medication to help that? What can trigger that? Yeah, look, for, so for a lot of people, it can be genetic. So mum or dad or grandparents or someone else in the family is more vulnerable to anxiety or depression, then unfortunately, you know, that person may be too. So a bit of a genetic lottery in some ways. Um, you know, sometimes those experiences that we have in our important little early younger years can shape, you know, our coping ability and how we view the world. Um, and also we're malnourished. If we're not eating, if we're not looking after our body, if we're not doing the right things, then that's going to add to our vulnerability as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think people are still working out the science of why do these things happen. Um, but I think for a lot of people, honestly, they're just unlucky. Mm -hmm. Just medically, they're more vulnerable and then, Sometimes a little trigger, some event comes in and it just activates that. And, yeah. You know, unfortunately for them, they do need more, more assistance at that time. Yeah. Do you think most people that you see with mental health issues need medication? So I see a bit of a biased population. Okay. It's pretty rare for me to be the first step in your journey. So normally people have seen their GP or they've to the hospital because there's a concern or they've seen their psychologist for a while. Um, so usually if they're referred to me, the question is often around medication. Yeah, okay. You know, and for some of those people, it's clear cut and they need it. They talk about it and they're agreeable and we, we follow it up. Um, some people just want more information. They just want to know, what are my options? If I did get to that point, what are my options? If I did do that, you know, because they've got a lot of fears and parents have got a lot of fears and I think that's reasonable. Yeah. So yeah, so most of my most of my patients, if we're talking about the eating disorder group, um, probably on medication of some type because it, it is such a hard illness. It is such a big journey and a hard journey that anything you can do to help, you know. Is and the, me the medication, help. sorry, for eating disorders, does it target more, um, I guess, the depression side of things, or because not everybody has voices with anorexia. So what? does I guess the medication role with someone with an eating disorder so I guess that the challenge with an eating disorder is is the anxiety isn't it it's the distress yeah. of having 
you know, constantly thinking about your body, thinking about food, worrying about the implications of eating, you know, the stress of the treatment that you're having, because that's going to challenge a lot of that for you. Um, so I guess it's there to, to help reduce that anxiety. And often you find that anxiety and depression go a bit hand in hand. So pretty common going to be more vulnerable to feeling depressed or having depression if, you, if you've got anxiety or if you've got a serious eating disorder. Um, so it all sort of comes from the same place. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully you're, you're targeting both there, whether it's depression or whether it's anxiety or both, same treatment. Yeah. And is it possible for people to come off their medication? It's not something that they're on forever? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you would hope that most people would come off their medication. Um, so as I said, it's just there to, to augment your therapy. So if all you do is medication and nothing else, probably you stop it and things are going to get worse. But if that medication has allowed you to form more protective factors, so you've been able to weight restore, you're back at school, you're working, you've got a social network, they're all things that are going to protect you from anxiety, from depression, from the eating disorder. Um, so hopefully when the time's right, when the world's boring, when we've been well for a period of time, um, then you do for a lot of people. You try and reduce that dose, reduce that medication, and hopefully most go okay without it. Um, there are some that, that go, whoops, no, I still need a bit more support. And they're probably the group where there is that stronger genetic element. So those that already had major depression or major anxiety before they developed their eating disorder, okay. you know, get genetics. Um, so sometimes for that group, it is okay, I've got to go back on this again for six months or 12 months. And then I try again, but you should always be trying to come off it with, with the help of your doctor, and your team. Um, no long-term side effects from being on an antidepressant, so that takes a bit longer for some people. Um, it's not the end of the world as long as they're doing okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why it's important to raise side effects with your doctor because if there's a reason you don't want to take it, you know, you want to identify that early so they can find the right thing for you in case you do have to be on it in the longer term. Yeah. So just so that I understand as well, so serotonin, it's the happy hormone that makes you supposed to make you feel good? Yeah, essentially. So they're neurotransmitters. Okay. So they're all important in helping bits of our brain talk to each other. Yeah. The idea with anxiety, depression, is that people, they're making enough serotonin or noradrenaline is the other important chemical for that. So they're making enough, their brain's just using it up too quickly. Okay. So it's not Available. It's not there to create the stability they want. Yeah. So your antidepressant is sort of like putting a plug in the bathtub. It stops your brain from sucking it all up. Yeah. And now it's there to be able to use, to be able to access. Right. It's called right. SS, uh, serotonin, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So okay. it stops your brain from sucking up all your serotonin. And now you can use it. Wow. So when you come off that medication what is that process is it that your brain is stopping sucking that serotonin up and you've now got enough available how do you make that decision to not yeah well i guess you're hoping that if all those other positive factors have occurred so your weight's healthy you know you've got all these other things all these other positives that's going to help produce and maintain that serotonin as well yeah so i guess protective factors of maintaining your serotonin the way they would for a lot of people. So now when you remove the antidepressant, off they go, they're happy and, you know, good luck to them. Oh, it's very fascinating yeah. how it all works, all the chemicals. Yeah. It's like a big science experiment. <laughs> um, Hopefully you don't know. that's not the case. <laughs> yes. Well, I also wanted to touch a little bit on how the teenage brain works. So, Obviously, there's science to prove that the teenage brain doesn't develop until, well, a, a brain doesn't develop until later in your 20s. Um, and so how does that impact medication choices? Because if you've got an underdeveloped brain, does, are, do you have to be careful with the, the chemicals that you do put in or the medications you do suggest? Yeah, absolutely. So as you say, your brain is developing throughout childhood and adolescence and it's not till our you know, early adulthood where things start to stabilise a bit. Um, so look, that's also the positive, isn't it? That also means that those that did have problems younger can, you know, things can improve over time. Um, but anyone who's under 18, anyone who's had sort of a, a brain injury of any type, who has a neurodevelopmental disorder, 
who's malnourished and has been for a long time, um, you should see those people as vulnerable. So you are going to, in those situations, lower doses of medication, you're going to pick things that are better tolerated, you're going to pick the things that have the evidence that they're less likely to cause problems. Um, so it's go slow, low doses, you know, go with the ones that usually work. Um, but yeah, you do have to be mindful of that, that people are more vulnerable in those ages. Yeah. You know, practice and, yeah, do you find that parents are a lot more, I guess, actively invested in trying to give their kids medication to, to help them with, in your practice? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, parent, parents are playing an important role, aren't they? Pretty hard to, to treat somebody without family being involved. Um, you know, that's the main part of treatment, isn't it? Them being there, supporting you, being aware of things. Um, I, I think it comes down to an individual preference. There'll be parents who, you know, have either had their own experience with, with medication and they're open to it. There are those that, you know, no matter what will say no, or they've had their own negative experiences. So understandably, have some concerns about it. Um, but I think like anything, I think if you, can, if you can educate people, if you can answer their questions, if you can provide that treatment, you know, in alignment with what they want. So if you involve them in the decision making, you know, these are the options. This is what might help, this one might go wrong with it. Um, then you find that people are going to be far more engaging. Um, and if you've got mum and dad on board, that's going to make it far, far easier you know, to convince the adolescent that this might be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And how do you generally know if a medication is working in someone? Yeah, that can be hard, can't it? Because there's so much going on often. There's so many variables. Um, I'd usually rely on two sources. I'd rely on parents. So what's their objective feedback? You know, does their child look happier? Are those meals a little bit easier? Has there been a functional improvement? It's easier to go to school. We're performing a bit better. You know, we're a little bit less out of our bedroom. They're seeing you more. So I'm looking at that side of it. And then obviously talking to the young person, how do they feel? Has it given them any relief? Has it made anything easier? Is there anything that they couldn't do a month ago that's now less of a challenge? Because yeah. often you find sometimes the individual doesn't know they'll say to you, no, it's not helping, nothing's better, I feel the same. And it's probably true, they do feel the same. But that, that feedback from other people can sometimes say, no, actually, yes, you might feel the same, but there's signs that we're heading in the right direction. There's little improvements. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it, you know, it may just be a dosing issue. It's not enough to give relief, it's enough to give a little hint of a response and you just alter it. Yeah. Hopefully people are talking to, to families and to the young person together to get that information. Yeah, I think that was me in the early days. I was like, no, nope, nothing works. No, nope, don't like it. And it was only because I always used to search side effects um, box. And I was like, nope, I don't want to put on weight because that was one of the big things that was always there. Yeah, isn't it? Anorexia doesn't want, doesn't want medication. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Weight's going to be listed in that, in that little side effects box. Um, but again, you know, hopefully people are thinking about that when they prescribe that. You know, if you give someone something and everything says it's going to cause weight gain, good luck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> very fun. Yeah. Um, but reassuring people that this isn't to, you know, I think a lot of people worry that the medication is to make them put on weight. And it's not, it's to reduce stress, mm. it's to reduce anxiety, depression. That's what it's trying to do. Yeah. So and I guess yeah. there's so many factors with stress, anxiety, and depression. What do you think are uh, I guess the main contributors to if like, for example, if someone was very stress, stressful, should they take medication, even though they're not diagnosed with anything? Is it something that they should just look into? Yeah. So we're all going to have stress, aren't we? That, that's life. There's going to be ups, there's going to be downs. Where you might worry about somebody is when, when that stress starts to create a functional problem. Okay. Yeah. You know, again, Oops, sorry, my phone's just telling me it doesn't. That's all good. You're back. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so it's starting to cause impairment in their friendships, in going to school, going to work, you know, their happiness. That's where you might look at it. Um, for everyone, the first step's never medication. It is therapy. It's counselling. It's changing your lifestyle, your exercise, your eating habits, you know, getting family involved. That's always step one, no matter what the condition is. Yeah. Medication is then there for the group where they've, they've tried to do that 
and either their, their symptoms are so big that they just can't implement those strategies. So your psychologist telling you to breathe when you feel anxious. If you get anxious so quickly from zero to 100 that you can't stop and think, medication might help. Um, or when you put all these things in place and it's just not enough to shift things and it's getting worse. Okay. So uh, medication's never first line, manage stress levels, lifestyle, all of that first, and then the group where that's not enough. Yeah. And you worry, have that conversation. Yeah. Should someone with an eating disorder see a psychiatrist? Because stress, anxiety, and depression are normally such heightened experiences as someone with an eating disorder. Look, I think they should. I think I think if you, I think if someone's got anorexia, they, they need a team approach. So that's usually their psychologist, dietitian, their GP, um, and they often then need a paediatrician or a psychiatrist as part of that team, just to guide that specialist care. Um, and often, if they are, you know, given we're sort of mostly talking about medication here, um, I think a, a lot of GPs very reasonably are reluctant to start under 18s on, on medication because it is a sort of specialist area as with that vulnerability that we spoke about. Um, so I think a psychiatrist is helpful at those times um, and hopefully they've got that, that knowledge around anorexia and other eating disorders that they can then, you know, not only run your medication but also help coordinate that care. Yeah. More physical health, you know, if, if somebody did need admission, could they help with that process? Yeah. Uh, and you know, go all the time, but I think having that team, that specialist team around you is going to be far more successful. Yeah. If um, someone is malnourished, do you, and they are over 18, they come and see you, do you think it's better to have a parent there with them because they may not be thinking properly and making the, the best decisions for themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it probably doesn't matter what the condition is. You should probably have a support person who comes along because, um, you know, seeing, seeing a doctor, seeing a psychologist is kind of stressful too for a lot of people. Um, you know, and that anxiety will get in the way and maybe you don't hear everything you needed to hear or couldn't say all the things that you wanted to say that were important. So having another set of ears in the room who can support you, can remember things, can ask those other important questions, um, I think it's invaluable regardless of age, regardless of condition. But for an eating disorder, I think if you try and do it on your own, you're going to struggle. Yeah. You know, family or support, they're the key. Yeah. And why do you do what you do? Because I find every time that I sit in a session with you, it's, it makes me feel really good. And I don't know, because you, you're not, you don't just talk about medication. You, it's almost like a therapy. So do you have a different approach to general psychiatrists? Um, I, I don't think so. I hope not. <laughs> um, I mean, look, me, I, I chose psychiatry because you can individualize it. So if all I was going to do was talk to you about your medication and what are your side effects, I mean, I think I'd get pretty bored. That wouldn't be very rewarding. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the nice thing is, and I guess especially with, with anorexia, you know, so looking at your own situation, is you, you get to know people quite well over, the, over time. Mm. You see friendly, you get to know the family, you get a feel for what's going to work for that person, what's not. Um, so I think that's, for me, that's a reward, you know, that people let you into their lives and share these, these difficult journeys and, you know, the things that are probably hard to tell other people. Yeah. And that that individualizes it, doesn't it? Makes it unique. Yeah. And why did you choose? Most people get well, and it's, it's lovely to see. <laughs> yes, it is. It's fabulous to have. Oh, even for me to have such a supportive team that's always there for me. I can never thank everyone enough. And and you especially, you've been absolutely amazing. As I said, you always make me have a smile on my face. So it's a good thing. That's the type of therapy you want. <laughs> um, why did you decide to specialize in eating disorders? Um, I, I don't think I did. I think it sort okay. of found it. Yeah. Like people, you know, know what you want to do. Um, I think, I think the eating disorder side is just, I think I like that. I think you can give people relief by validating just how hard it is. Yeah. You know, by knowing that it is such a hard condition, it's, you know, not only for, for the person, but for their families. Um, and I think just seeing people go on that journey and seeing, you know what, if you do, if you do look after them, if you do give them the right care, if you do get involved, it can make a big, big difference to that journey and getting well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think it's not something I set out to do, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad when, you know, I can help people. Yeah. 
do you find that there's with the people that you do see with eating disorders that there is hope for recovery and people do get better absolutely um you know the earlier that intervention the better so you know if there are parents watching this if, if you if you're worried if you suspect anything's not right go get checked you know you don't wait till you end up in hospital that's that's where it's harder you know when you've got a really weight restore you want to get in there early that's where the best prognosis is mm. um, but you know the sort of the most recent stats i saw said that about 50 percent make a full recovery you know you're probably looking at 30 percent making a partial recovery and then unfortunately there's that group that are stuck and need longer term care um, but i think if you if you get in there early if you've got that family involved if you've got more of a holistic approach where it's not just medication or it's not just psychology you've got a whole team um outcomes much better yeah i guess the the other thing just to mention is if parents do take those active steps in the initial phases to go and get help and they're turned away what advice would you give to a parent then if they're told that oh you're overreacting or we've got a wait list or how can you encourage a parent to know, seek more help? Yeah, it, it is hard, you know, because I think it's hard to know where to go to start with. Um, so, you know, I think for a lot of people, their GP is probably going to be their first point of contact. Um, so I think it's the job of, of those involved in the industry to be, you know, educating those GPs, what to look for at those early appointments, what are the warning signs. Um, I usually work on the parents know best. They know their child. You know, they fed their child for however long. They they know when things change. Um, so I would I would persist. If you're not, if you think the GP, you know, if the GP or whoever you saw said no, we're okay. Let's just monitor it. And look, that may be the right step for a lot of in a lot of situations. But I think if you're worried, if you don't feel you've got the answers you're after, then then I would see somebody else for a second opinion. Um, or you know, your local mental health service might be able to help at those times. I think as long as people are aware, as long as they're monitoring it. Yeah. You know. okay. And what about someone that doesn't have um, a parent that's playing an active role in their lives? And I guess sometimes they may think something's up with them or a friend might notice that something's wrong. What role can they play in helping that person and helping themselves? Yeah. Look, anything's hard without family involved, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it, it is a battle. But I guess if, you know, sometimes it is school, sometimes it is friends that start to, to raise concerns or it comes up when you're seeing somebody for something else. Um, I guess, again, you would hope that, you know, whoever that is that's trying to offer support would help guide the young person through, well, look, let's just go see someone and get this checked or try and bring, you know, a parent or a carer, you know, an adult into the conversation, yeah. you know, but find the gentle way to do it, the right way to do it. Yeah. And if the child is reluctant to seek help i know in my initial stages i'm like there's nothing wrong with me i'm not sick um what can you do in those instances do you just literally have to grab your child by the arm and shove them in the gp office or sadly you do um i think it'd be pretty rare for, for somebody with anorexia to say hey i've got anorexia can you please help me you know anorexia says there's you know there's nothing wrong with you you are overweight you do need to lose weight mm -hmm. don't trust those people they're gonna they're gonna make you fat that's what anorexia is going to say. So I think it would be very unusual for a young person with anorexia to voluntary, you know, voluntarily turn up, tell you everything and ask for help. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that's why the importance of a parent or a carer or somebody else who can advocate for them because they may not be able to advocate for themselves because they're unwell. Um, and look, I've had parents who can't get the young person in and they might just come in on their own. Yeah. You know, that situation, we want to talk to you about it. What do you think? What can we do? Um, and then you try and find a way, you know, can we find a more gentle, less threatening way to get that person to come in and, and have a chat? You know, yeah. can we do it on the phone? Is that less threatening? Is there somebody mm -hmm. else? So sometimes there might be a family doctor they trust. And you can talk to that doctor and, hey, next time you see them, can you check out the following for me? Yeah. Um, but it is tough for parents because, mm. you know, most, most people are going to be fighting the whole way. <laughs> Yeah, and if you're over 18, how can you help someone that doesn't want to be helped? Yeah, the over 18 group's hard because, it, you know, different rights. It is harder to get people into treatment. Um, so look, 
you still sometimes will get the families who come wanting advice or they're calling you know their local services um, and look there are the sad situations where you just can't get people in um, and eventually the only way they do come to receive help is when it goes wrong when they have a fall or there's a health problem from not eating that results in them turning up to an emergency department and then that's the first time they actually get engaged in help um, and you know I think that's why we want to we want to encourage people to get help early because we don't want that to be the situation mm. you know rather rather see people when they're when they're well yeah you know, it's out. just I think it's the hardest thing with eating disorders is when they don't see that I know I didn't think I was sick and if I was over 18 I wouldn't seek help because I didn't think I was sick and that's why as you said I think it's so critical when you're in those younger years and you have a parent who takes on the role and creates your team for you that's right you know and I guess you'd hope that okay let's say you're over 18 you don't have that you know hopefully you're going to your GP for something you know hopefully they they're asking the questions, but they may not know you. They may not know mm. what life was like six months ago. Um, so yeah, it, it is hard for those that don't have that support. They don't have people watching out for them. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I want to. I want to thank you so so much for your time because I know how incredibly busy you are with all your clients, and you are an amazing psychiatrist. And I can now call you an incredible friend. So I really do appreciate your time and everything that you've done for me throughout my whole journey. Yeah, I'm actually, you know, that doesn't happen without, without your family, you know. So in your situation, myself and I know from talking to the others involved in your care, your, your family really make it easy, you know. And I don't, I don't I can ever remember you sort of being too rude or too combative. You might have been outside of seeing me, but, you know, you've always been nice and polite and friendly, even when I was telling you stuff that you probably thought was mean. So, yeah. No, thank you. Easy. No, thank. Oh, thank you so much. You uh, make treatment worth it. So I really do appreciate it all. Um, and so I let you get back to your day. Um, and thank you everyone out there for joining us for another Secret Sunday session that has been amazing with my psychiatrist. Hopefully, you've got something out of it. I know I definitely have. Um, so thank you, Dr. Glenn Craig, and we will all see you soon. <laughs>